Ten years ago, UK retailer Marks & Spencer launched Plan A, which has become a continuing mission to completely restructure its supply chain, from the thousands of small farms and factories that create its products to the millions of consumers who buy and dispose of them. The name Plan A serves to remind us that we have just one planet, and there is no Plan B. Today, Marks & Spencer is the world's 32nd most sustainable company out of 4,000 audited by Toronto-based corporate nights. More importantly, only one retailer, Finland's tiny Kesko, placed higher. That's a stunning achievement for a major retailer like M&S. But the company's sustainability director, Mike Berry, says he still considers them only 25% sustainable. To improve their own operations, he says, they have to work with other companies to overhaul the entire ecosystem within which they operate. Man may be unwittingly changing the world's climate through the waste products of his civilization. There's a group of us now who are proposing that the Earth has actually entered a new epoch, and that is the Anthropocene. Anthropocene. We know that the enemy is carbon, and we know its ugly face. We should put a big fat price on it, and of course, add to that, drop the subsidies. Earth, we broke it, we own it, and nothing is as it was. Not the trees, not the seas, not the forests, farms, or fields and not the global economy that depends on all of these. But we can restore it, make it better, greener, more resilient, more sustainable. But how? Technology? Geoengineering? Are we doomed to live on a bionic planet, or is nature itself the answer? That's the question we address in every episode of Bionic Planet, a podcast of the Anthropocene, the new epoch defined by man's impact on Earth. And today we talk to Mike Berry of Marks & Spencer, a company that, together with Unilever and a few other good actors, is working to not only clean up its own operations, but to make it easier for other companies to do the same. A quick note on today's show. I spoke with Mike Berry over two months ago by Skype for an article on Ecosystem Marketplace. We started late, were pressed for time, and the sound is a bit garbled. But the content is fascinating. Still, with that garbled sound, I debated with myself over and over about whether to use it for this podcast or just harvest it for the article, especially since a lot of you are supporting the show as paid patrons. I didn't want to charge for something that I felt was subpar. In the end, I decided to use the interview, but not list it on Patreon, which is the service that I use to process your support payments. So if you're one of those people whose generosity keeps this thing going, this one is a freebie. If you're not a paying patron, but like the show, you can still help by giving me a good rating on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you access podcasts, or you can share Bionic Planet with friends, or the ultimate support, become a paid patron at bionic-planet.com. I've set the patronage page up so that you can help per episode, but with a monthly cap. So if you think $5 per month is good, you can pledge $1 per episode, but with a $5 cap. That way, if I don't manage to generate five episodes in a month, you're not paying for something you didn't get. And if I go nuts and deliver 20 episodes, you won't get whacked either. By the same token, you can offer $5 per episode or 10 or 50 or whatever. I won't complain. I'm aiming to mostly do interview-based episodes for now, but given the complexity of the material, I'll be interjecting occasionally to clarify certain concepts. It's a hybrid between a straight interview and a feature package, although I still think that in-depth features with multiple voices and some story structure are the best way to tell complex stories. Unfortunately, they do take a lot of time to construct, more time than I have right now, and they require the help of a second set of ears and a good sound technicians to do right. Until I can afford that, I'm concentrating on generating these simpler, single-issue, single-guest podcasts. This one, as I said, is a bit garbled, and there's a lot of stuff I learned after doing the interview. Stuff that made it into the article, but that I didn't have the presence of mind or the knowledge to ask while we were speaking. There's also someone I wasn't able to interview, but wish I were. 
Stuart Rose, who was CEO of M&S back in 2006. He did something extraordinary then, which the articles do cover. Namely, while ExxonMobil and the Heartland Institute were working overtime to discredit climate science, Rose was treating 100 of his top employees to a day at the movies. And the movie he brought them to was Al Gore's climate change documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. The next morning, Rose checked his email. That's scary, read one. This is amazing, read another. We ought to be able to do something, read a third. Simply by bringing them to the movies, he'd whipped up support for improving everything from the way the company interacted with the thousands of small farmers who produce its raw materials to the millions of people who buy its products. He asked investors for 200 million British pounds to get the program off the ground, arguing that it would eventually pay off in lower energy costs and reduced risk. One thing I've realized since getting into this green space, there are good green CEOs like Rose and Paul Pullman of Unilever. And there are good companies, too, and good corporate cultures and bad ones. They are not all the same. And now to my interview with Mike Barry. I didn't realize that Marks and Spencer had been working on sustainability going back to the 1920s with uh, direct sourcing of, of products and free-range eggs in the 90s. And it says that Plan A was created to make the sustainability strategy more holistic. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of go back to 2007 when, when you guys launched this and recall its genesis, you know, how, how it began and, and also who came up with the name. Yeah, really good question. So, so Marks and Spencer, as you said, over 132 years of, of history has done an awful lot um, on what we now call sustainability. But back in the 1930s, it was about good employment practice, no welfare state, great economic de- depression around the world. Um, the, being, being a responsible business then was not about climate change or deforestation or fisheries. That those issues hadn't yet emerged. But looking after your people then really matters. And M&S became famous because it invested into its people, looked after them, and in return got better service for its customers, which helped in return grow the business, a virtuous circle, a business case, before anybody talks about business cases. So M&S can go right back through its sort of its, to its genesis, as, as can many businesses, you know, have been around for 100, 100 150 years, and recognize elements of what they do today way back when. So that's, that's an important sort of reference point. When 2004, a new chief executive came into uh, Mark and Spencer, so Stuart Rose, and, and, and Stuart had been with the business for 20, 30 years, left and came back to run the business and saved from takeover. And Stuart recognized that what we were doing at the time was what I now call CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility. It was good risk management, stop bad things from happening. And M&S was very good at that. Let me interject here because a lot of people use the terms sustainability and corporate social responsibility interchangeably but they're not the same thing. Generally speaking, corporate social responsibility, or CSR, means doing the right thing to be a good corporate citizen, maybe to avoid getting into trouble or to comply with a law, while sustainability means doing the right thing to ensure your own long-term survival. When companies like Mars, Dannon, and yes, Marks & Spencer, invest in thousands of small farmers, they do so in part to make sure they have reliable supplies of raw materials for the future. That's sustainability. When those same companies funnel some of their sales to charities or parks, that's CSR. Now the two are not mutually exclusive, and Plan A does both. Everyone has their own distinction between the two, and Barry's distinction is that sustainability is about taking a long-term approach to building a lasting business in a lasting world while CSR is about avoiding risk, often by implementing specific measures that most people think are good. Carbon offsetting, which we covered in episode 14, could be considered CSR, and ecosystem marketplace research shows that companies often start with the belief that they can reduce their emissions by simply buying offsets, but that then leads to more holistic approaches to reducing emissions. We covered that in episode four of Bionic Planet, which you can find at bionic-planet.com. 
98% of what we sell in our stores is our own private label product. We've got good understanding of our supply chains, the factories, the farms, the raw material sources that produce our goods. So we could put in place pretty good standards to, to make sure bad things didn't happen. But Stuart turned around to some challenges and said, come on, guys, you know, Marks and Spencer is not about just being a good risk manager, just, just sort of safely ticking along. It, it's, it's about re- redefining retail for the 21st century. So I want you guys to reinvent CSR. Um, and from that prompt and a, a degree of Anglo and Saxon invective that you always got from Stuart to keep you moving forward at the right pace, he gave us three months to sort of um, redefine CSR. And from that came Plan A. And, and I think what makes Plan A different from CSR are, are four things. The first thing I think we've mentioned, which is scope. So, you know, Plan A covers every social environmental issue relevant to M&S. Some are big risks, make sure there's no problems in factories. Uh, some are big opportunities, sell more fair trade coffee and tea. But many are just prosaic social environmental issues that don't really touch the consciousness of the mainstream or the mainstream consumer. But it's the right thing to tackle and do. And in fact, from tackling and doing them, you get a significant business case. You know, we saved £180 million last year from less energy, less waste, less water. Not sexy things, but just made us a better business environmentally and financially. The second thing that, that made Planet different was about value chain. So what Mark and Spencer owns are lorries, offices, and stores. And you, clearly there are social environmental impacts associated with them that you need to put right. But the true impact of any retailer is downstream. Um, and upstream. So think of all those thousands of factories, tens of thousands of farms, raw material sources, the cotton fields, the palm oil, etc. We had to take responsibility for putting that right, even though we didn't own it. And the other direction, 32 million customers buying 3 billion items a year from us, an item being anything from a bottle of wine to a pair of slippers, and helping them use those products more sustainably as well. So Plan A said we would work across the totality of the value chain, even where we didn't have a legal ownership obligation. The third thing that Plan A had was business case. It said very clearly that this is not just about protecting the business from unhappy events on the, in, in the newspapers. This is about making sure that we are lean. And we've talked about the 180 million saved last year. Uh, resilient supply chains are able to deal with climatic extreme social um, unrest around the world. Um, motivating for our people. You know, go back to that 1930s point. Our people feel purpose driven for working for a great brand and therefore give great service to our customers. Um, There's a whole bit then about new business models, and I think we'll touch on that in a moment. We're very clear that um, over the next five to ten years, there's going to be real disruption in the marketplace, how people consume products and services in the future will be radically different, very much more sustainable, we should should hope. And M&S wants to be well positioned and ready for those marketplaces. And the fourth and final reason that makes Planet different from CSR was metaphorically CSR was run by a hundred good people with a clipboard checking that bad things didn't happen. And what we're trying to do with Plan A, we're not perfect, but what we're trying to do with Plan A is make sure everybody sees the opportunity to do their day job more sustainably, whether they're run marketing or lorries or computers or buying or selling, whatever it may be. And from doing their job more sustainably, which is better for pe- people and planet, they also get a better personal outcome for themselves in terms of business success. So they're the four building blocks of what made Plan A a great leap on from the CSR that we had been doing, and, and, you know, a few people still do. And I I guess the the finishing point is, you know, even 10 years on after 230 awards, 180 million saved last year, very high levels of trust in our consumer base, despite things like horse meat happening and Rana Plaza that M&S had nothing to do with, there's high levels of trust in the Mark and Spencer brand, which is great. Mm -hmm. Having said all that, uh, metaphorically, we are but 25% sustainable. There's at least 75% of the journey that lies ahead, despite 10 years of hard work and many awards. There's so much more to be done. So I, I think that's just, that, that's just the sort of the, the gestation of it. And you asked who invented the Plan A name. It was a guy called Robert Nuttall, who was our head of internal communications at the time when we were developing the plan. And literally the night, two nights before we launched it, he looked across at me and said, Mike, you've got this 100-point M&S sustainability plan. That's great. Well done you. Greenpeace will love it. Um, it'll mean nothing to 32 million customers or 83,000 colleagues. Give me a little bit of money. I'll go away and help invent a brand. He came back <laughs> with Plan A because there's no Plan B. Yeah. It doesn't get any more complex than that, but well done, Robert Nussel. Your, your, your name is forever written in uh, a little bit of um, history and light to M&S. And thank you to him. Yeah, I've always thought it was a great name. Um, now, now this is because so you sat down and you came up with these hundred points, and then after five years, you you did it again. When you were working out these these next hundred targets, what was that? What was that process like? That must have just been arduous. Yeah, that, you know, that's a really interesting point, and I think it goes back to this 
this whole point that building a sustainable business is not just a five-year plan done and dusted and move on. It might take 20, 25 years to build a truly sustainable Marks and Spencer. And inevitably, you can't have in retail a 25-year plan. Things change by the day, the week, the month. So what we have to have is a recognition that every few years, and five's a nice cycle, that we would update the plan and think about where next with it, and we've done that twice. And as we did it, we recognized that we were going through five stages of change. The first stage, 2007 to 10, was very much about footprint reduction. Make m and less bad, less wood, less, uh, less um, energy, less waste, less packaging, better wood, better fish, better cotton. So it was about making our existing business model less bad. And all that work continues, but at heart, that's what it was. It was about making what, what we did better. The second phase we then entered 2010 was for integrating into the business. So this point that... When you push a button at M&S to get something done, within reason, plan A happens automatically. Every Mark and Spencer product has to have a plan A story to tell by 2020. It's not about having a, a range of the corner of a store called ethics and then everything else. Every Mark and Spencer product, all those three billion items, is on journey to improve, 72% there now. Every Mark and Spencer food factory is on the bronze, silver, gold ladder of improvement when it comes to sustainability. Uh, as it pushes up there using less energy, better employment practices, you get a business case. It's a leaner factory, it's a more productive factory, it's a better quality factory, it's a virtuous circle. So what we're doing is systemizing Plan A just into the, in, so it operates automatically within M&S. And again, not perfect. I've already said we're 25% stable, not 100%. But that's the second phase. The third phase is probably where we are now, which is mass engagement. So 83,000 colleagues, 32 million customers. All of whom sense that M&S is a good business and does good things, but would struggle themselves to put too many things on too many things that we did um, explicitly. And also to be clear about their own individual responsibility as an employee or a shareholder or as a customer in driving the journey forward. So the third phase of the journey is very much about engagement and helping people see that why we need to change, that we can change, and by changing we can make things better, not just for the plant and people, but for individuals as well. The fourth phase is about partnership, and that's taking uh, the work to do with being less bad to scale. So if, you know, if we want to build a truly sustainable supply chain in terms of sustainable palm oil, tiny little M&S is not going to make the world palm oil production sustainable on its own. It needs to work with consumer goods forum, with Unilever, um, with Coke, with Pepsi, with Walmart, with all the others to make sure we move the industry together. He mentioned the Consumer Goods Forum there. That's one of the dozens of multilateral sustainability cooperatives, for lack of a better word. That's where you get a bunch of companies that work in the same commodities to cooperate on sustainable sourcing. And the Forest Trends Supply Change Initiative, that's supply change with a change, you know, change like changing something rather than uh, not, not chain, initiative has found evidence that such cooperatives work. If you go to the show notes for this episode, episode 16, at bionic-planet.com, you'll find a link to a report called Tracking Corporate Commitments to Deforestation-Free Supply Chains 2017. This was an analysis of the nearly 1,000 companies that supply chain tracks. They also looked at 35 of these multilateral sustainability cooperatives, and they found that at least 95% of the companies participating in such groups had pledged to reduce their impact on forests, and usually in ways that are verifiable. That's a start. And then the fifth and final phase is what we've just spoken about, which is radical disruption, new business models, you know, do you buy clothing in the future, or do you rent it off people, return it, got a second life, a third life, a fourth life. So that's preparation for a very different way of making money going forward. And, you know, you'll have a series of plan A's touching all those areas at any one time, with perhaps with a focus on one of them, that we're constantly having to update every few years. Um, I say we've done that twice, and never we'll have to do it in the future. I think before I get into the specific pledges on the, the four deforestation commodities, it might be a good t- time to touch a little bit on the this, this whole idea of, of, of having each product, making sure that by 2020, I think you said, each product will have one plan A attribute. And yep. uh, that I found I found really interesting. I think you're up to 73% of the products have one now. Yeah, that's right. And I was looking through your material. You had a very detailed process for deciding which attributes to take. And I'm wondering if you could maybe summarize a little bit on that, how, how that how, how that idea came about, and then and how you go about de- deciding what is and is not an attribute. Yeah, good, good question. And again, we go back to 
the desire back in 2010 not just to have a niche organic and fair trade range in the corner of the shop and just tick the box. We wanted every single commercial category at M&S, every single IP on a journey to be better. Now, some of that was very obvious. You know, all the fish that was becoming MSC, coffee and tea was becoming fair trade. You know, these are very obvious, well-recognized external standards that said, uh, here you are, M&S, credible standard for you to claim against. Um, you can use it. But clearly, there are certain issues where there isn't a global, widely accepted standard. So let me use the example of factory management, significant environmental social impact on factories. I've just told you, spoken to you about the bronze, silver, gold ladder that every MS food factory is on. We've developed a standard that said if you get to silver standard um, as a food factory, all the products coming out of there for MS meet have a planet attribute to them. Very clearly defined metrics in terms of 20% less energy use, zero waste to landfill, um, high levels of uh, HR um, performance in terms of where people are looked after. So we had to set our own standard. We as a central team then, uh, you know, we, we have very tough discussions across the businesses to make sure that the, the things that we accept are credible. We have a series of star chambers once a quarter where rightly the business units come to us and propose new approaches. And we want them to be innovative, to find solutions, sustainable solutions that don't exist in the marketplace yet. Um, equally, we, want, we need them to be robust and credible, so we will have a dynamic discussion with them that says great innovation, but not quite ready for uh, bringing into the planning attribute family. Um, but by and large, it's worked very, very well. Um, and say 73% of our products now have planet built into them. Now, that's one story. You know, ultimately, you want to have two stories and three, you know, one for the man raw material, one for the manufacturing, one for the use disposal phase. But what you've got now is, is a systemic flywheel spinning in the business that's progressively adding sustainability to every product uh, rather than treating it as a niche. So that's the background to it. I was really impressed with the, the rigor that you went through. You guys seem to have some, some pretty uh, intense internal debates about what should and should not be considered an attribute. I thought the, the, the section on biscuits was interesting because I think you, there was a debate about whether you should uh, include the sustainable palm oil as an attribute. And I think on the one hand, only 1% of, the, of, the, of what's in a biscuit is, is palm oil. But then you realize that that little 1%, because you were, you were demanding that the palm oil be certified um, sustainable, that it, it altered the suppliers, so you decided to make that an attribute. Did I did I understand that correctly? And is it so? So so again, very very important point because what what we're saying is there isn't a black box scientific mm -hmm. system anywhere in the world yet that enables you to put all your products through and it come back and say mm -hmm. um, biscuits. You know, it's thirteen point eight percent the factory and twenty eight percent the um, the palm oil in it and sixty two percent the sugar in it. You, you need a to take a a professional view based upon stakeholder engagement, based upon science, but, you know, lo lots of inputs, and decide what's the right um, priority issue, what's material to that product. So on, if you went simply by mass or volume, well, clearly palm oil is a, a, a very limited input um, to a biscuit compared to, for example, the wheat and the sugar uh, or the chocolate. But when you actually think about the actual issues involved, it is very material and important. So again, there has to be um, these decisions. And one of the things why Plan A is so helpful for MS is that we, after 10 years of hard work, I think society and stakeholders give us the benefit of a doubt in accepting that our decision-making, provided it's transparent and open, they understand and respect why we take particular judgments rather than asking for page after page after page after of proof. Mm -hmm. So I think what you found on a website is, is an evidence trail to say this is not just made up, here's some difficult decisions we have to deal with, but there's also no respect there from stakeholder communities that says in the real world that m &S operates in, it's never quite perfect, and you do have to make some judgment calls. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, that's, and that kind of brings me to the, the four, what we call the big four deforestation yeah. commodities. and. Um, you, you, you know, we track all these different pledges, and we also track the progress that, that companies are reporting. And what I find interesting with you is you, you, your pledge is zero deforestation, which is a really tough one because it's hard, it's hard to quantify. Others have made pledges that you consider a milestone. One example is uh, palm oil, which we just, just discussed. 100% uh, of your palm oil is RSPO certified. That, from your perspective, is a milestone towards achieving zero deforestation. What, starting with palm oil, what else do you think will, will have to happen before you can achieve zero deforestation in palm oil? 
So this this goes back to this this, this fourth phase of change, which yeah. is about partnership. Because again, there is no point Marks and Spencer creating this tiny, tiny, tiny ecosystem mm. of perfection with sustainable palm oil and around it rages a fire, literally. We have to be part of the systems change. And that system changes in part because all the retailers that we work with at the Consumer Goods Forum and, and brands line up and specify the same high standard of expectation of their supply chains. So Unilever is saying it, Procter & Gamble is saying it, M&S is saying it, same with Tesco's, et cetera. Yeah. But even that's not enough, because even if we could make all those individual supply chains sustainable, it is still leaving a significant amount of global trade, particularly mm-hmm. to places like India and China. Out. Let me interject again, because he's introducing some really big issues here. First, some perspective. M&S's $23 billion in revenue amounts to little more than a rounding error in the $100 trillion global economy. Even if they did get to be 100% sustainable, it wouldn't matter if most other companies didn't do the same. That, however, is a moot point, because they can't become 100% sustainable unless we fix the entire ecosystem within which they and other retailers and manufacturers and everybody else operates. That's because supply chains are incredibly complex. They interweave and overlap, as we saw in Episode 11, where we looked at a new platform called Trace, that's T-R-A-S-E, not C-E, that made it easier to track soybeans to the parts of Brazil they're coming from. Now, as Barry points out now, it's ridiculously expensive for companies to police their own supply chains individually. So companies that try to do so end up giving bad actors a double advantage. It also means that there is a, it's a very costly way of trying to improve the system. So if I'm spending you know, a lot of time and effort and cash to, to police my supply chain and down the road Sainsbury's doing the same, and down the road Tesco's doing the same, it wouldn't be so much easier for all of us if one jurisdiction had a good approach to managing forests. I hate to pop in again, but this is huge. M&S, Unilever, and a handful of other companies are looking to support sustainable jurisdictions, meaning states or counties within countries that promote sustainable agriculture. This way, they can buy from those regions and pay a premium, and maybe good practices will spread to neighboring counties as well. Mm-hmm. So if I, in my ideal world, and I'm talking about ideal now, not, not reality, I could turn around and say, I buy all my palm oil from Indonesia. It's got a good law for palm oil, it's got a good regulation system for palm oil, it's got a transparent system to make sure that um, the standards have been policed. Um, it, I, I can buy within reason, with impunity from there, without having to micromanage the supply chain. Now, that is an ideal, it's a wish, it's, it's a dream for the future. But that's where we need to get to. m and sells 35,000 different product lines. You know, something like Walmart probably sells many hundreds of thousands. Or each containing, uh, you know, many dozens of raw materials involving many, many, many factories and farms. The, the the sort of the matrix of policing and auditing you have to do ultimately there is is just insane. It's just too much. So ultimately, we it's in our interest as businesses to see regulatory systems form around us that we can participate in, that allows us not to have to micromanage every single thing. Of course, you'll manage risk and you'll you'll look into issues and you'll check things. But to be able to buy from a jurisdiction that overall manages things well has got to be the ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. Now, what we're now saying is, so having put our own house in order with 100% sustainable palm oil and m and products, we're aiming collectively with the industry for zero net deforestation. Even that's not enough. Beyond that, then, we're, in, we're seeking to encourage the Tropical Forest Alliance the um, take up of a better overall approach to regulation across whole jurisdictions and regions. Quick interjection again, the Tropical Forest Alliance is another of those multilateral sustainability cooperatives. Yeah, and this goes back to what you, you made that pledge right before the Paris Climate Talks, where you committed to source materials from G, uh, from jurisdictions that are deforestation free. Um, yeah. is, any, is anyone close to that right now? I, I think there will be individual dis- jurisdictions in in um in, this, in the Southern Pacific, in, in Brazil, which can start to head in that direction. Mm-hmm. Um, I won't score them personally my, 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 myself at this stage. I'll leave it to somebody with a little bit more expertise. But um, there are definitely individual regions that are starting to emerge as potentially preferential places to buy. So they've got that house in order, and that in turn will attract more trade, because I want to avoid the cost of having to police everything in the Wild West. Mm-hmm. And secondly, it'll attract more investment from aid countries, the UK, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Americans, as they 
um, preferentially put aid money towards well-managed jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So there is a business case at a jurisdictional level to take this seriously and do it well. Is there also a risk, though, that if you're avoiding high deforestation jurisdictions, you're just kind of, you're not really improving them, you're just leaving you know, the, the people who don't care to go in there and source material from them? Yeah, and I, and I think that is um, very interesting as well, because, uh, again, this is the whole philosophy of that not banning palm oil, for example, from our supply chain. You know, there's one school of thought, an external stakeholder view that says, just get our palm oil, but that mm -hmm. leaves the problem just for somebody else to deal with, or not, mm -hmm. as the case may be. You know, mm -hmm. the Chinese or the Indian marketplace ain't going to happen at the moment. So we, we very strongly believe in not cutting and running. If you find a problem in the factory to labor standards, you stay and solve it. If you find a problem in a, in a forest, you stay and solve it. So within reason, we've, you've, we'll always stay and put something right if we find a problem. However, if, if all you ever do is that, you'll never actually shift the dial. You, you have to show people that by migrating to the better place and the sustainable running of your economy and your region, you're going to be rewarded. So you can have a foot in both camps. This issue came up in the episode on Trace, episode 11, that I mentioned before. Do you pull out of bad jurisdictions, or do you stay and try to improve them? There is, as you'll see, no easy answer, and the same applies to suppliers. m and has proven its willingness to both work with suppliers and drop them if they don't shape up, as it did with Asia Pulp and Paper, or APP. You'll be encouraging people into the positive place but not running away overnight from the difficult place. But there'll be a migration between the two. You guys blacklisted uh, APP and then also... Yeah. Israel. How does that fit into this whole question of uh, standing and fixing or cutting and running? Yeah, so, so in terms of this philosophy of not cutting and running, uh, sometimes you find in your supply chain suppliers who, despite you saying, we found a problem, we want to work with you to solve it, refuse to acknowledge there's a problem or don't have a wherewithal to change it. And you work with them and work with them and eventually just say, it can't carry on, we, we, we need to stop. It's quite rare. You know, most suppliers will, however grudgingly, say, yeah, we, you know, bank to rise, we, 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 we need to change. I think in the past, at uh, the start of the journey, before we had um, a lot of the work going on with Consumer Goods Forum, we were all moving forward um, consistently together. It was quite intimidating um, being an individual retailer in this space. And you had to take some quite precautionary decisions about who you worked with and who you didn't. I think back, way back when, we took a decision that certain suppliers we didn't want present in our supply chain, given the, uh, the allegations leveled against them um, mm -hmm. and the lack of evidence that they were working to, to deal with them. I think now, as, as, as the world moves on, there, there is more and more evidence that the world's big commodity producers are collectively working much harder in this space. Not perfect, but I'm not claiming we are either. Um, but are moving in the right direction. Um, so I think it, it will become less prevalent um, generally, but it will remain a place of last resort for any business to say, look, you know, we've given you a, a go, you've, you've, you've not listened to us, we're going to blacklist you. And uh, you, know, you see still, you know, Unilever, I think, recently have, have, have pulled away from a particular palm oil producer. It's, it's a final warning and it sends a message to the marketplace that you're very, very serious about these issues. Um, you guys are working with DNV to uh, kind of assure your planning. Yeah. Uh, DNV, by the way, is a Norwegian company that sets standards and tests compliance and everything from automotive emissions to health care. M&S asked DNV, as well as WWF Netherlands and Greenpeace, to verify their activities. Uh, how, how has that worked, and do you see that as something that could uh, become a standard for zero deforestation commitment reporting in the future? Sure. So, so we've, we've, traditionally, we've always had a very clear external report each year to say how we get on with 100 commitments of Plan A. Very open, very transparent. Um, several years ago, we said we, it has, it's not enough that we produce it needs to be independently assured, first by EY uh, and now by DNV. Both done a very, very good job for us. And in terms of credibility and transparency, um, they're the bedrock of, that underpins all of Plan A. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a great believer that any business that's serious in the space should have independent uh, assurance of its of its claims um, out there. And, you know, we're a good business. We don't lie. We, but we found that as soon as we brought the independent auditors in, we were pushed to yet another level of transparency and openness about what we did. And I think we were starting from a good place. We had an award-winning report already. But by bringing that sort of external scrutiny in, that's, that's, that's been uh, additionally powerful. I think what you then need 
you, you then so each individual business of, that's leading the world sustainability needs its own independent assurance of its claims and its of its plans. Whether then you then take a whole sector and say, okay, consumer goods form, you're all making these claims on um, de- uh, heading towards zero net deforestation. I can sort of find them in all your individual reports, but it'd be good to have a comped up figure uh, that is independently assured on a, a CGF level. I think that discussion will come. I, I think you've got to walk before you run. You need to make sure all the members of that club or that family are um, working that direction, doing things in the same consistent way. It's not without its um, complexities and not without some, some risk of bureaucracy. Um, but certainly the more transparency we've got, and, you know, for example, we've just put all our factories that we use around the world um, up on our website last year saying nothing to hide, these are the factories that we use. Um, so the, the drive towards transparency, not just at the factory level, but the raw material level, the standards you apply, the, the performance you're reaching, is only going to get more important. Okay, um, I could go on and on. This is really fascinating, but we're just about out of time. Is there anything you wanted to say in closing, anything that we maybe should have talked about but didn't, a question I should have asked but forgot to? Um, no, and I, I think that's been a very comprehensive sort of um, walk through what we do. Uh, again, let me finish where I started, you know, that sense of we've done 25% sustainability. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm very proud of what MS has done, and I, I, I would stand up next to anybody and make a claim that we're among the lead, world's leading companies in this space. But if the leaders have only done 25%, and actually the 75% that lies ahead, the new business models, the sheer scale of getting uh, an attribute for every single product, then two attributes and three attributes, all the things that we need to do, you know, there's an awful lot still to be done. And my, my single biggest concern for the marketplace as a whole is scale. Because I think what at the moment we are is a little bit preoccupied by chasing Unilever or Nestle or m to be even better, get from a gold standard to a, a, a platinum one, when actually what we should be focusing on is getting a million companies just to do bronze sustainability and then move to silver and then move to gold. Because it doesn't matter how good Unilever are, they're mm-hmm. still only a fraction of the world's production and consumption. Um, we should all be preoccupied by the need to get everybody engaged and moving forward at a, a steady pace. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Keep in touch. Mike Berry wrapping up this garbled edition of Bionic Planet. I hope you were able to follow it, and I encourage you to read the article, or articles, there are actually two of them, either on Ecosystem Marketplace or in the show notes for episode 16 at bionic-planet.com. In our next episode, we'll be speaking to Andrew Mitchell, the Oxford forestry professor who founded and runs the Global Canopy Program and now advises impact investor Ecosphere Plus. Finally, if you like what you've heard so far, be sure to let others know and give us a good review on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access podcasts. You can also become a patron at bionic-planet.com. If enough of you help me out with just $1 per episode, I can take the time to do these right. You know, every time I listen to one, I do I hear something I want to do over again. Something where I talked too fast or had my mouth too close to the microphone or just didn't make the sense I wanted to. But doing them over takes time. And a good sound man and a team of people who can be a second set of ears or a third set of ears before I hit the upload button. Your support can make that possible. That's all for today. Until next time, I'm Steve Zwick in Chicago. Thanks for listening.